Ela told us Noach. These are the chronicles of Noach. Now, the word told us could either mean chronicles about his life, or it could mean his children. Now, if it would be his children, it seems it's unnecessary. Because we had said in the previous parsha that Noah had three sons, Shem, Chom, Vyethes. So we already know the Torah already shared with us who his children were. So what it told us referring to, so the Midrash tells us what are the chronicles of a tzaddik? What is the essence of a tzaddik's accomplishment? His masim tovim, his good deeds, his spiritual status. Ela told us Noach, Noach is tzaddik. These are the chronicles of Noach. What is Noach all about? What is his life all about? He's ish tzaddik. Tomim hoi b'dorosov. He was perfect in all his generations. Es olokim hislach Noach. Noach walked with God, or God was associated with Elokim, Noach. So Rashi over here cites the Chazal, Medrash, and which is very interesting, you know, there's a post in Nishlei, you know, we speak about a person who's a tzaddik, or somebody who has some degree of specialness, we say, Zecha tzaddik lebrocha. We say, Zecha tzaddik lebrocha. Shlomo says, when you mention a tzaddik, you should always mention him in the context of brocha. If you speak about a tzaddik, and when you speak about an evil person, Shame Rishom Yirkav. The name of the evil should rot. What's the concept? Let's say I speak about Ramosha Feinstein. There was a rabbi, Ramosha Feinstein. Zechat Tzadik Levrocha. And I don't identify him as somebody very special. That he should be blessed. So then people, when they hear about this person, or see this person, they just gloss over him. He doesn't touch people. But if you identify him, whenever you mention him as brocha, this person should be blessed, that means he's something special, then people take notice. When we speak about a Rosha, he says, Shem Rosham Yirkav, the names of the evil should rot. Meaning, when you speak about a Rosha, you should not ever speak about him in any positive context, no matter what, because he is a representative representation of something evil. You don't want him to be noticed. So even if he has a positive feature, you don't speak about that positive feature because if he's noticed in any positive context, he will be, the takeaway is going to be that positive aspect. But when you take that takeaway, you also are touched by everything else he represents. Therefore, he says, Shem Rosham Yirkav, the name of the evil should rot. Something rots, goes into the oblivion. It's like it never existed. But the tzaddik, even after he passes away, whenever you mention him, it's levrocha. It's always in the context of brocha. Elu told us Noach. So seemingly, if we're speaking about his progeny, why we all of a sudden, why do we digress and we speak about his personal classification as a human being? Tzaddik, Tomim, Dorosov. The answer is, because the first thing you do, first and foremost, even though we're going to speak about his children, his progeny, we have to identify him, who is he as a person. So Rosh says, Ho, Vizkiro. Once he's mentioned, Sipi Bishwacho. We immediately speak about his praiseworthiness. Shinemar quotes the post initially, Zechet Tzadik Livrocho. When you mention a Tzadik, it should always be immediately in the context of Brocho, Dovracher, another interpretation. Why it's not, according to this, it's not a digression. It's not a digression. Loma Ch'ika told us, saying, shall tzadikim masim tovim, that the main accomplishments, the main ramifications of a tzadik, what is his legacy? What is the main legacy of a tzadik? Not his children, but masim tovim, the good deeds. That's the main legacy of a tzadik. Therefore, Eilu told us, these are the told us, so the Orachim HaKadosh shows, even though he has children, but what are, he doesn't say, Masim Tov Bishel Tzadikim is told the same. 
He says, Ikar, the main, meaning the children also told us, but compared to the good deeds, it's, it's secondary. Ikar, Rashi uses the word Ikar, which is Chazal. The primary accomplishments of the Tzaddik are his Masam Tovim. He may have children also. Now, the Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin that it's Aramaic. That a child brings merit to the father, but a father does not bring merit to the child. What does this mean? Verse 9 is a father, great tzaddik. So as long as the child is alive, we speak about schusovos. That a person has opportunities in life due to his father or a uh, an antecedent who was before him, who he descends from that person. But once a person passes away, his record is evaluated based on his own behavior. It's irrelevant who his father was or his grandfather was. You're graded on your record. But what about a person, the father wasn't, wasn't anything special, but he had children. And those children were very special. The actions of the children accrue to the father. Why? Because the father wouldn't have brought those, those children into existence, all those positive actions would have never happened. Those mitzvahs would have ne never happened. The Torah would have never been studied. So therefore, the child brings merit to the father, even after the father passes away. The child brings merit to the father because only due to the father bringing that child into existence are those actions positive. Even if the father had no influence, he didn't even encourage it. It doesn't make a difference. That that the child exists and something positive is happening, the father is either directly or indirectly the cause of that. As a result of that, the actions accrue to the father at some level. But the other way, special as the father was, he could have been Moshe Rabbeinu. But if the child himself was not special, the father, the actions of the father, the grandfather, or any previous generation has no relevance to the child himself, only in his lifetime, in terms of opportunity, protection, whatever it may be, then we speak about schosobos. That's the Midrash. So when you leave this world, all you can take, what is once considered, what, what's your legacy, what's your accomplishments? Your accomplishments are only masatotovim. It's only what you, you accomplish in the spiritual realm. What you accomplish in the physical realm has no relevance to you once you pass away from this world in terms of your record. When we speak about eternity, that has no relevance. The Chobetz Chaim writes, the Abbas Chesed, that there's something a person can have which is to perpetuate that person's so-called spiritual account. If a person sets up a gamach, a free loan, even beyond his lifetime, and that loan, free loan account lends money and does chesed on an ongoing basis, that free loan account continuously generates merit for the person who set up that account. Because beyond his lifetime, it's only happening because that person created this entity called free loan. If a person sets up a kolel and puts money, bequeaths money in account for the kolel that people should be able to study. So the reason why they're studying beyond this person's lifetime is only due to what he had left before he passed away, what he set in place, that there should be funds to allow this, this reality to continue. Or you support a Torah institution. And continuously, it only exists because of what you did. All the Torah that's studied and all the mitzvahs that are generated due to that accrue to that person. So, the primary accomplishments the chronicles, the legacy of a tzaddik or his masam tovi. Children also, but compar comparatively speaking, <clears throat> it's secondary to what the person accomplishes himself. This is interesting. You know, we know the Torah is so careful that a word is only used or stated because it's necessary to say what it says. In this one posuk, we have the word Noach, reference to Noach mentioned three times. Ela told us Noach, Noach is Sadiq, Esel Kim Noach. 
the word Noah, it doesn't say, we could use the pronoun. These are the chronicles of Noah. He was. Vuhu is tzaddik. And you could have said, Vuhu is elokim. So why does the Torah mention the word Noah, the reference by name three times? That's the Medrash, ask this question. It's the Medrash Tan Chuma. So the Medrash tells us something profound. The reason why it mentions Noah three times is because Noah lived before the Great Flood, which was one era. He lived during the Flood, where he was confined to the Teva, to the Ark, together with all the living species. And he lived post-Great Flood. This is the reason why the word Noah, the reference to him as a person, is mentioned three times. That's the Midrash, That's what the Midrash answers. So I asked the question. Let's say who would have been mentioned by a pronoun. El told us Noah, Vuhu ish tzaddik tom derasa. Vuhu his es vuhu is salech im elokim. Just by reading the narrative, I know the reality of his life. He's lived. He lived pre-flood. He lived during the flood. He lived past post-flood. Why does it mention the word Noah three times? What does the reference of Noah mentioning him by name? What does that add to our understanding? of pre, during, and post? That's the question I asked. So what we said in the past was this, what the Torah is telling us, you know, you find people in their lives, whatever they are, that they, they're they involved in whatever they're involved in, their impact is whatever they impact, and they keep expanding that impact, but it's on the same trajectory as what they began. What about if you have three people unrelated to one another, three separate individuals, and their names are Noach? Noach A, Noach B, Noach C. Although they have the same name, they're three separate individuals. Noach, as one person, lived three separate lives. In terms of his function, his impact pre flood, he was one thing. He's Noach A. During the flood, the Gemara tells us, Later we say, Ach Noach. Do you know what it means? He had to attend to the needs of every living species to feed them. 24 hours a day, he was involved. Whatever was humanly possible, he would, and he had definitely, there was divine intervention. He was able to maintain all the life within the table. And he orchestrated everything. He was literally a super zookeeper for a year to guarantee the existence of that there should be an existence after the great flood when all these species leave the Teva, leave the Ark. Now there's a question which is asked when it says Ach Noach, the Gemara tells us that because Noach had brought the food to the lion late, late, he was, he was mauled by the lion and he became actually, he became handicapped and he wasn't qualified to do the Avoda because he became a Balmum. Therefore, it says Ach Noach. Ach means he groaned from pain because he was minimized. Because he delayed bringing the food to the lion, therefore he was what? He was maimed. So they ask a question. I mean, what do you expect from a person? The man is working 24 hours a day, maintaining the existence within the table. And if he was delayed, you know, I mean, give the man a little, a little leeway. But yet, if he was maimed, that means he was punished. I mean, why didn't he divine, merit some divine protection that he should not be blamed, maimed by the lion? Because the lion, and why did the lion, why was it allowed to maim him? So the answer which is given this, when Noah was in the in, in the in the table with every species, as we read, every non-kosher species, it was only a male and a female. The kosher was seven. What would have been if, as a result of delaying bringing the lion the food, the lion would have died? You know what would have been? The existence after coming out of the Teva wouldn't have been that existence that God created. Because God created that every species that was in the Teva, it was meant to be that species should be able to, should not become extinct. If one of the mates would die in the, in the ark because you delay bringing its food, what did you do? The existence that comes out, that's going to be, which follows, this period of time is not the existence God wanted. Therefore, that's the reason we had that level of culpability. Because if he would have sensed what was at stake, 
that delay would have not happened. Therefore, he was held culpable. So when he was in that Teva, and he was acting in the role of zookeeper, what was more than zookeeper, it was to maintain existence. This was existence that was meant to be in the future. Because if he didn't fully uh, accommodate and assume that responsibility to its fullest extent, the world, the world that comes out after this is not the same world. Because the species are not the species that God created. Because one of those species is no longer going to be. That's why he was held accountable. So Noah was a maintainer. His focus was not meditating about God. He was busy, occupied, totally consumed with this. He comes out after the Teva. What does he do? The world that existed prior no longer is there. Comes out only with his three sons and their wives. Now he has to set a, a direction, a perspective. How do, how do we address all the issues to prevent or to maintain existence that things should not repeat themselves as they were pre, pre, pre-Great Flood? It's a whole different level of responsibility. So in essence, Noah, although he's the same person, he's the equivalent of three separate people, three separate individuals. What is his pre-flood? He was not during the flood. What he's post-flood was not what he's pre and during. Therefore, by identifying the three, by mentioning his name three times, he's the equivalent of three people. So it's Noah, 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 Noah A, Noah B, Noah Z, as if the three people have no relevance to one another. When there was a famine, Yaakov sent his sons to Egypt to purchase grain. Otherwise, they would have starved. So when they went the first time, they didn't realize the viceroy of Egypt was their brother. And he had taken Shimon as hostage. And he says, unless you bring back your younger brother, don't come back. They come back and they share this with their father. And his fa- their father berates them. What did you have to share with him? Did you have a younger brother? He says, well, he knew everything. Through divination, he knew everything. He knew we had a younger brother. He was even able to identify us and, and tell us the exact what our cribs, our cradles, what they looked like. And he says, and he says, unless we come back, we bring our younger brother, we can't go back. And Judah says, let's wait till we run, we're barely at the end of our food, food supply. Our father's gonna have, not going to have a choice. He's going to have to release Benjamin. But Yaakov would not release Binyamin unless somebody took responsibility to make sure he's going to be brought back. So Yehuda was committed to bring Binyamin back. Yehuda is the one who made that level of commitment. What kind of guarantee did he have to give to his father? The guarantee he gave to his father is that if he doesn't bring Binyamin back, he will forfeit his physical world and he'll forfeit his share of the world to come. If he does not bring him back, he'll be excommunicated in the world to come. Be in a state of excommunication. Yaakov agreed. Now, we'd read in Zosa Brocha, when Moshe gave the Brocha to the Shvotim, he says, Ul Yuda, Omar. The Gemara tells us in Makos that a person who accepts excommunication, which is called Cheren, even on a condition, if at the time you accept that you have no control to make sure you're going to be able to execute what you're meant to execute, even on a condition the person is excommunicated due to what you had done. Yaakov allowed Yuda to enter into this binding situation. Anything less than that, Yuda understood his father would not allow, give over Binyamin to Yuda. Now the question is, Yudah was had royalty, had leadership, had power. Do you mean to think, to say for a moment, Yaakov didn't trust Yehuda, that he wouldn't do his best? He would do his best. So why did he have to bind himself in the physical and the spiritual? And only then was that a sufficient guarantee for Yaakov to release Binyamin? It's an obvious question. And look at the consequence. For 40 years, the words of Chazal, Rashi cites it over there in the in, in Rashi, the Midrash, that his bones were rattling in the coffin for 40 years. And the Gemara tells us in Sota, Yehuda was not, his Nisham was not admitted into Yeshiva Shomala, into the heavenly Torah academy, 
until Mo, Moshe prayed for him to be readmitted and he should take on a primary role there in terms of royalty. Why? Because Yuda understood that Yaakov understood that although we may believe we're doing our best, but always based on what's at stake, that will guarantee that you're doing your best. If Yuda puts everything on the line, his share in the, in the physical world and his share in the world to come, if you put everything on the line and that's at stake, you're going to do your best. If it's less than that, you may believe you're doing your best, but you're not doing your best. That's why Yuda committed himself to such a degree, understanding what Yaakov understood, Anything less than that wouldn't have been sufficient for Yaakov to release Binyamin. So he definitely, Noah had the capacity to succeed. He failed. And he's faulted for failing. The whole world was destroyed due to his failing. We'll see in a moment later, I don't mean today, that Noah only went into the Teva because of the floodwaters. The floodwaters forced him in. Even though God says, go into the Teva. Because I've already sealed the fate of this generation. He did not believe it was going to happen until he saw the floodwaters, which he was forced into the Teva. I mean, if God says, you worked on a project for 120 years. It's your focal point for dialogue. And now he says, it's over. I will destroy them. You and your family will survive. Why was it so difficult for him to go into the Teva? He had to wait for the flood waters to force him in. The answer is very simple. That that Noah was forced to go into the Teva, you know what that means? The world is being destroyed because you failed. That's what God is saying. Noah, you failed. The mission I gave you, you had the ability to succeed, you failed. And because you failed, the world is going to be destroyed. To be able to swallow that kind of pill, Humanly, it's very difficult. So you you will delude yourself. It's not going to happen. Maybe this, maybe that. The only way he saw reality is when he experienced the reality the floodwaters forced him in there. Because he failed. What do you think when he came out of the table? What did he do? The Torah tells us he planted a vineyard. And he had grapes and he drank and he became drunk. And due to this state of drunkenness, a disaster happened. Chum went, either castrated him and sodomized him. But why did he drink? And the Midrash says, before what was Mo, what was Noach? He was Esalukim Isach Noach. Afterwards, he's referred to there as Isha Adoma. He became a vineyard keeper. Here he's man of God, now he's a vineyard keeper. What happened? You know what happened when he came out of that ark? There was a world that was teeming with people. He had the ability to turn them around. He comes into a world now, perfect, beautiful, pristine, but there's no humanity. Why is there no humanity? You know why there's no humanity? Because he failed. To be able to be confronted with that level of guilt, so to say, he drunk, drunk himself into a stupor. He planted a vineyard. He needed that fix. And that's why he drank. It was too much for him to handle. He didn't have the capacity because he failed. That the Torah tells us he was a tzaddik in his generations. Those interpret it to be praiseworthy. Torah is pointing at something which is praiseworthy about Noah. Others interpret it, what the Torah is sharing with us is to be critical of Noah. The fish Dorohoyatzadik, comparatively speaking, relative to his generation, he was a tzadik. But if he would have been generation of Rom, he would have been considered nothing. It's a pretty strong term, nothing. He would have considered ordinary. He would have been noticed. Avram's dimension, what he brought the world to in terms of recognition and place in spirituality, he would says it would have been compared like to, as nothing compared to Avram. Avram succeeded. You know, there's a famous Rabbeinu Yonah in his commentary on Pirkei Ovos 
The Mish tells us in Pirkei Avos, there were 10 generations from Noach, from Adam to Noach. And there were 10 generations from Noach to Avram. And why is the Torah, why, what, what, what is the, the Mishnah pointing out? Kema, kama Erech We see the patience God had. Although they were evil, he gave them 10 generations to turn around. And after 10 generations, he destroyed the world. And with 10 generations from Noach to Avram, again, they repeated the behavior. And God would have destroyed the world only because he made a covenant that he wouldn't. That's why he did it. Now, and says, the Avram kibel scharken in Kulam. And Avram received reward versus all 10 generations. What they were meant to accomplish during those 10, ten generations, Avram received reward on behalf of all of them where they fell short. So there's a beautiful Rabbi Yona in his commentary on Pirkei Avos explains it this way. It's only worthwhile for God to maintain existence if there's a minimum level of value. But if you can't meet that minimum level of value, it's not worthwhile for God to build this existence. There were 10 generations from Adam to Noah. The people fell short. It wasn't worthwhile. The only way the world could have continued, we God wouldn't destroy them, the world, if Noah would have picked up the slack and would have accomplished what those 10 generations were meant to accomplish then it was worthwhile for God to maintain existence. But because Noah did not succeed, he failed, did not make up for that vacuum, which was as a result of the people failing, God destroyed the world. Avram was so great, although the 10 generations failed, he was able to fill in that vacuum and pick up the slack. Therefore, it's Kibble Star Kinegat Kulam. That's why God did not destroy the world. So therefore, if he would have been the generation of Avram, he would have been considered like nothing. Avram received reward for 10 generations because his accomplishment was what the 10 generations were meant to accomplish, Avram as an individual accomplished. Noah couldn't do that, therefore the world was destroyed. This is Rabbi Yona. It's worthwhile to see it inside. So, so either the Rosa means he Lishevach, despite his generations being evil, he was a tzaddik. But it's what? It's Lignai. If he would have been a generation of Avram, he would have been considered nothing. So it's pointing out something negative, not something positive. So now, my Roshiv Zechariah used to say, both positions, in terms of the reality, don't disagree. Compared to his generations, he was a tzaddik. Despite their evil, he was a tzaddik. And Factually, if he would have been in the generation of Rome, he would have considered nothing. So they're not arguing on the fact of Noah versus his generation and versus Avram, right? They're not arguing. The question is, what is the Torah pointing out? Just the simple understanding. When the Torah says, though, Rosov, is it coming to emphasize this point or that point? That despite the generation, he was still able to pull himself from his bootstraps and become the tzaddik? which is a great accomplishment, but nevertheless, compared to what Avram did, he's nothing. What exactly is the Torah coming to point out? A or B? That's the question. But a reality of what the reality is, they're not arguing the reality. Compared to Avram, he would have been considered nothing. Regarding his generations, a phenomenal accomplishment. Okay, just a simple understanding of what the Rosa is coming, what the Torah is trying to communicate to us.